So, we'll just have a quick look at Tyre in ancient history. And so Tyre is an ancient Phoenician port city which in myth is known as the birthplace of Europa, so how Europe got its name, and Dido of Carth Carthage, who's the one from, I suppose, that movie Troy, who fell in love with that the Aeneas of Troy. Um, the name means rock, and the city consisted of two parts, the main trade centre on the island, and the old Tyre about a half a mile opposite on the mainland. So the city had the main city on the mainland and there was an island about half a mile to a mile um, in the Mediterranean just off the, off the coast. The old city known as Ushu was founded in 2750 BCE uh, before Common Era and the trade centre grew up shortly after that. It became very prosperous and populated, it was heavily fortified. The prosperity of Tyre attracted the attention of King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon who lay siege to the city for 13 years in the 6th century um, without breaking their defences. During the siege, most of the inhabitants of the mainland city abandoned it for a relative safety of the island. And so they built a new city um, uh, on the island. So when uh, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon broke through, the city, uh, it, the, the city was uh, uninhabited. He didn't realise that it all escaped to the island half a mile off the coast. The issue became a suburb of Tyre on the mainland and remained so until the coming of Alexander the Great. So Alexander the Great, about 250 years later, uh, came back and finished the job. As we can see down here, there's Tyre there, and the island would be somewhere here. So Alexander the Great came and laid siege, and there's the island, there's the old city of Tyre down here, which was destroyed by uh, Nebuchadnezzar. And then 250 years later, Alexander the Great came and used the rubble of the old city, which Nebuchadnezzar had destroyed and threw it into the water or the timber and the old rubble rocks and made a causeway across to the new island and laid siege to it and so as we go back and read um, we can see that uh, Ezekiel foretold six things that would happen uh, he would bring Nebuchadnezzar the king of Babylon against Tyre many people in Tyre would be killed uh, the ruins of the city would be thrown into the sea. The city area would be scraped free of rubble, like the top of a rock. And fishermen would use this site to spread fishing nets. So even to this day in Tyre, where that old site is, the old ruins, um, the fishermen uh, still throw their nets in the water and fish. Um, so this remarkable prediction was fulfilled in every detail. Soon after the prophecy was written, Nebuchadnezzar attacked the city. Many were killed, and the rest were locked inside the city walls. The Babylonian army laid siege on the city for 13 years, but they finally broke in, only to find all the people were gone, and they had moved to an island half a mile offshore. 250 years later, Alexander the Great set off to conquer the world. The people of Tyre felt safe on their island fortress, but Alexander was determined to overthrow them. He commanded his men to throw the ruins of the old city into the water and build a causeway. To the island. The old city was scraped free of rubble like the top of a rock, as mentioned in the scriptures, and Alexander marched his army to the island and conquered the new Tyre. Today it is common to see fishermen spread their nets where the old city once stood. Three attempts to rebuild the city have all failed. Uh, Ezekiel 26 states, I will make you like the top of a rock, you shall be a place for spreading nets, and you shall never be rebuilt, for I, the Lord, have spoken, says the Lord. So we can see that God made a prediction, a prophecy, if you like, and it came true uh, to the word because the Lord said it would happen and it happened. Um, we can also uh, look at um, Egypt. So surely Egypt enjoys a glorious past, but what of today? God's word 
records a prediction. So let's look at Ezekiel 29, 14 through 15. So I'll read it now, starting from verse 14. And I will bring again the captivity of Egypt and will cause them to return into the land of Paphros, into the land of their habitation, and they shall be there a base kingdom. It shall be the basest of kingdoms. Neither shall it exalt itself any more above the nations, for I will diminish them, that they shall no more rule over the nations. So while Egypt was, has made some progress in recent years in dam building, etc., yet 70% of the Egyptian people can neither read nor write. And in many areas, the women and children are still the beasts of burden. Anciently, Egypt was famous for her supply of papyrus. So that's the paper reed that used to be abundant along the Nile. Uh, and the papyrus reed grew bountifully along the River Nile and other waterways. However, God foretold that the paper reeds by the brooks and rivers uh, would wither and vanish away and be no more in the land of Egypt. And even this minute detail has been fulfilled. So if we look at Isaiah 19 verse 7, and the paper reads by the brooks, by the mouth of the brooks, and everything sown by the brooks shall wither and be driven away and be no more. So in another, I think it's the American Standard uh, Version, not the King James Version, it says the papyrus reads. So as translated as the papyrus reed, which was very, which was what they used to make paper of, which used to be very bountiful along the River Nile, uh, shall wither and shall die away. Now, I think the only, if you go along the Nile now, you will not see the papyrus reeds. Uh, I think the only one they have alive these days, or one of the very few they have alive, is in an Egyptian museum. Uh, it's uh, it's in there to see, and uh, so even this prediction here has come to fruition in Egypt. So, as we can plainly see, um, God, whatever God says, uh, comes true, and He says it many, many years in advance, as well in some cases. So, you know. I, the way I feel at the moment, it, we only need to look to the Bible uh, for proof. We don't need to look to science. Um, you know, science I think suppresses science and archaeology gets uh, suppresses what uh, the evidence that they find, which proves the Bible. Uh, but that's just my opinion, of course. Okay, moving on to something else. Um, so. Let's look at the ancient city of Petra. Now, some of you may recognize uh, this picture here. Uh, the ancient city of Petra uh, featured uh, in Indiana Jones, one of the Indiana Jones movies. I can't remember the exact subtitle of the movie. And also, in, more recently, in Transformers. And you would have seen uh, these, this ancient city uh, played a part in there. but. Um, this ancient city of Petra uh, was in the land of Edom, and uh, so you know it, it's marvelous what they did there. Look at that; it's, it's really stunning what they've done. But uh, God even made a uh, prediction, a prophecy regarding this city. So Petra is a fantastic place. Every building, over one thousand of them, is carved like a cameo from the living rock. On the highest mountains around the valley are to be found the places of human sacrifice. Every week young women were sacrificed to the sun god. This was a gruesome practice in which the girl was defiled and then while she was still alive, her heart would be torn out of her body and while it was still beating, offered to the rising sun. God hated sun worship and because of this, uh, he predicted the doom of Edom. So if we look at Jeremiah 49 verses 17 through 18. Also Edom shall be a desolation. Everyone that goeth 
by it shall be astonished, and shall hiss at all the plagues thereof, as in the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, and the neighbour cities thereof, saith the Lord, No man shall abide there, neither shall a son of man dwell in it. And if we also look at Isaiah 34, uh, verse 11, uh, it tells us that thousand beasts would make their dwelling in the ruins of Edom, and thorns and brambles would grow in the palaces and fortresses of the city. Nothing could be more accurate for today. Petra is a desolation. So we'll just read that. Uh, but the cormorant and the bittern shall possess it, the owl also, the raven shall dwell in it, and he shall stretch out upon it the line of confusion and the stones of emptiness. So, yeah, God even makes a prediction about Edom as well. So we all recognise that. Uh, and even today, it's desolate. No one lives there, uh, as God predicted. And only the owls and the fowl of the air make their nests, you know, in here and, uh, you know, Nothing grows there, you know. There's no plants uh, and and stuff like that. Nothing could be more accurate than these two verses in Scripture. Okay, so moving on, we'll go to another city. Uh, we'll go to Babylon. And uh, God made some prophecies uh, about Babylon as well. Now, look, I've just Googled Babylon and clicked images um, so we can just have a quick look here um, and see you know how splendorous it was it was just a m magical marvelous city um, if we look at this one you know, this, look how grand it was the city of Babylon um, now if we look at it today uh, it's pretty much in ruins. You know, if we look at it today, there's not much uh, left of it. And so God also uh, made uh, prophe prophecies, foretold the future of this city. And um, so I'll just go through uh, some of them with you also. So we'll come to Jeremiah 51. And again, this is uh, foretelling what will happen to the grand city of Babylon, ancient city of Babylon. Uh, so in Jeremiah 51, I'll just scroll down to verse 26. There it is. And I'll read that to you. And they shall not take of thee a stone for a corner, nor a stone for foundations, but thou shalt be desolate forever, saith the Lord. And then if we go down as well to 37, and it says in verse 37, and Babylon shall become heaps, a dwelling place for dragons, an astonishment and a hissing without an inhabitant. So those who have visited the site of ancient Babylon report that it is still desolate waste today, without an inhabitant. But the prophecy is still more definite than that. So even today, uh, it hasn't been rebuilt. You know, it's just... Uh, uh, a place for lizards and stuff. Uh, a dwelling place for jackals, you know, like uh, just wild animals. No no man or woman or child uh, lives there, even to this day. I think um, uh, Saddam Hussein tried to uh, build it at one stage, uh, but then along came George Bush Sr. and put a stop to that. So, um, you know, even to this day, as God said, when he says, thus saith the Lord, that means that's what's going to happen. So the, but the prophecy, like I said, is still a bit, is still more definite. So we'll move on to Isaiah 13, verses 20 through 21. And it shall never be inhabited, neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. Neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there, neither shall the shepherds make their fold there. 
But wild beasts of the desert shall lie there, and their houses shall be full of doleful creatures, and owls shall dwell there, and satyrs shall dance there. So even after two and a half thousand years, the, the Arabians still exist, but there is not a Babylonian on the earth today. The mighty palaces and hanging gardens of Babylon are only a memory, but the Arab still lives in his tents. How did Isaiah know that the Arabs would continue to live near Babylon, the ruins, for two and a half thousand years, but would refuse to use them for a shelter? Uh, explorers and ex excavators uh, report that it is impossible to eradicate this idea from the minds of these people. There are many particulars in this one prophecy, each of which furnishes proof of divine foresight, but together they would fill a large book. And let's move on to Israel, from Petra to Babylon now to Israel. Here is another prophecy, one which every nation in the world has helped to fulfill. The prophecy concerning the people of Israel. In Leviticus and Deuteronomy, Moses outlined the political and religious history of this race of people for over 3,400 years, from about 1500 BC uh, to this present moment. So let's look at Leviticus uh, chapter 28, I think it is, 26, sorry. And we'll just scroll down to verse 33. And it says, I and I will scatter you among the heathen, and I will draw out a sword after you, and your land shall be desolate, and your cities waste. Then if we can scroll down to 44, it says, And yet for all that, when they be in the land of their enemies, I will not cast them away, neither will I abhor them, nor to destroy them utterly, and break them and to break my covenant with them, for I am the Lord their God. So these ancient people of God have mingled with all nations for over 2,500 years that they have always maintained their racial identity. And so even when God says he will cast them out into the lands of their enemies, um, he will not abhor them or destroy them utterly. And he will not break the covenant with them because he is still the Lord their God. Now, during this same time, many other nations have arisen, remained distinct for a while, and then disappeared in the mass of mankind. We need to look only at America where millions have poured in from other lands. An immigrant group may preserve its nationality for a generation or two, but after that it is lost. Not so with the Jews. They are found in every nation. As the prophecy said, they would be, but always and everywhere they are distinct. So just about everywhere you go, uh, the Jews stand out, don't they? They're always distinct. As it continues to say in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 25, the Lord shall cause thee to be smitten before thine enemies. Thou shalt go out one way against them, and flee seven ways before them, and shalt be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth. So, it's basically saying, you, sh you shall become troublesome to all kingdoms of the earth. So, <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not uh, being anti-Semitic here, but um, pretty much everywhere the Jews go, uh, the people always seem to... Um, uh, become annoyed with them because they stand out, they're very distinct, they have certain ways about them and uh, they're, they're still very inclusive of each other and they don't tolerate um, uh, different cultures really or they claim to be, they still claim to be uh, the only uh, culture that is deserving of uh, the covenant that they made with uh, our God uh, many millennia ago. So yeah, it, you know, the Lord is still describing that even though, even though he's cast them out into many lands, they will still remain distinct. They will still be very much 
uh, noticeable, very much recognizable uh, as you know, we show as Leviticus and Deuteronomy uh, clearly explains. So, as we reach the end of the prophecy part of this Bible study, uh, we're coming near the end now, and we're going to look at the power of the Bible. Uh, consider finally the Bible's claim to have life-changing power. So we we'll look here uh, in Romans 1 verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek, so meaning the Gentile. Uh, so, you know, I am not ashamed, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. So when it says Jew and Greek, it means Jews and Gentiles, meaning everybody. So how shall we test the truth of these claims? Only by personal experience. The divine authorship of the Bible is not established by argument, but by experience. If we will give it a fair trial, it will prove itself to us. So let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So through the power of the Bible, countless men and women have broken the chains of sinful habit. Blasphemers have become reverent and pure. Drunkards have become sober. Criminals have become trustworthy and industrious. Cannibals have become kind and gentle. Souls that have, that have borne the likeness of Satan have been transformed into the image of God. This change is the miracle of miracles. So let's just look at Psalms 34 verse 8. O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. So if we will receive the Bible for ourselves as a prescription from the great physician, we too will become living witnesses to its life-changing power. So friends, to believe in the Bible as the word of God, in not following cunningly devised fables from science mainly, the Bible is a proven book. The evidence is overwhelming. Search its pages and you will find God's message for you. You see, the Bible is God's book of instruction in order that we may know how to live this life. But it is more. It, is also, it also shows you Jesus Christ, the way to everlasting life. So that's the end of this Bible study today. Um, I think I've shown you uh, from the start of the, the study you know, uh, first, the footprints of God in the earth and the footprints of God in the heavens, the footprints of God in our bodies, how um, archaeology illuminates the Bible. Um, you know, the spade unearths the truth is a good saying. Uh, constantly, archaeology is digging up uh, uh, more artifacts that just back up the Bible, back up the stories of the Bible. Uh, but you'll find that the powers that be and scientists and all that, they tend to suppress uh, that kind of information because they just don't want to believe it. You know, also putting the Bible to the test, uh, the permanence of the Bible, uh, you know, and the prophecies like the city of Tyre, Egypt, Petra, and Babylon, and Israel, uh, and later on, you know, the power of the Bible, which we just went through then. So, friends, I hope. You know, this Bible reaches you uh, in the spirit of the Holy Spirit. Um, I pray to the Lord that the words of this Bible study uh, resonate with you, uh, that they help you uh, reach Christ, come to Christ. And uh, that would be my only wish. Uh, and if it, if it does so just to one person, uh, then it was all worth it. So having said that, um, I will end the Bible study now, I'll end this video. Uh, feel free to comment and subscribe. And um, having said that, uh, I'll see you at a later date. God bless.